Yeah, hello, welcome, welcome very much to a uh, truncated meeting of uh, ACAP, which was scheduled for today, uh, the uh, October 29th, uh, and we've been beset by a hurricane, as all are aware, who might be viewing on the stream, and what we're doing, our guest was to be uh, Howard Bloom, a, a major intellectual who's written a new book called The God Problem, How a... Uh, how, how a Godless Cosmos Creates, a major work, and he was going to be our guest, but the hurricane has tied everything into knots, so we've not been able to do it. Uh, we wanted to try and do a, a good Skype thing with him, but it didn't work out. There were some technical problems and also some weather things. So what we're doing is we've got Howard on the uh, telephone, and we're going to be talking with him for some time, uh, in view of the fact that we had announced there was to be a, a stream. And so that's what we're doing now. I would hasten to add that Howard has very kindly agreed, in terms of all the unforeseen circumstances, uh, to uh, come next week, a week from today, that would be November 5, and uh, have the presentation that was to be done here in person, as they say, as, or in poison, you could say, as Jimmy Durante used to say, he will be here next week and we'll have our meeting as it was intended to be held tonight. But without that, with that, with that who may, those who may be viewing or those who may tune in, um, welcome, uh, welcome to the program, the stream. And Howard, welcome very much to, uh, to the ACAP stream. It's so good to be in touch with you this evening. Thanks, Harold. You are a source of joy and pleasure in my life. <laughs> Thank you, and you are in mine. So we're talking now, and I we're going to be talking about a number of things. We're to, we're the uh, the audio portion is with uh, you know with a telephone uh, a connection, and um, there's so much going on now, and uh, we wanted to uh, talk about a number of things. I I think it might be appropriate. Maybe we could give a little tip of the hat to the fact that we're in the middle of a uh, major, apparently, storm that's of monumental proportions. I wonder, has it shaken you up? And I understand you may be reporting on that in other venues and so forth, but this is some hurricane that really has thrown things into a loop. An unforeseen circumstance, no? Well, it's shaken me, um, and I hate to admit that, because uh. whoever wants to feel shaken. <laughs> yes. But, but, and I love to be the mastery of all things, Yeah. that's my limited ability. Mm. But it's shaking because um, Brooklyn, um, where I live, Park Slope, has seemed absolutely um, impervious mm. to storms and natural disasters of any kind. So and I've lived here since 1971, um, mm. a good long time. Yeah. So um, I just took it for granted in every conceivable circumstance that if there were problems, tornadoes, hurricanes, floods, they would not touch Park Slope. Uh, but that was shaken about two years ago. Mm -hmm. I was uh, meeting in town on Madison Avenue with a couple of people, and I got a call, and, and the weather was bad. Um, there was a lot of rain. And I got a call from my assistant saying that the skylight on our roof had just been torn off. <laughs> mm -mm. Now, how often do you get a call like that? That's a um, wake-up call of a yes, good, good proportion. Call, sometimes makes you, it makes you think, oh, my gosh, she's just being an alarmist, and I didn't really understand what she was saying. Uh -huh. Well, when I got home, it turned out there had been a tornado. Mm -hmm. Yes, a tornado, right here in Parksville, Brooklyn. Right. Whose house had it aimed precisely at? <laughs> Blue. Right. Uh -huh. Yes, it had not touched the house to the right. <laughs> 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 Dorothy had nothing on you, huh? Yeah, so yeah. it simply ripped off a third of my roof. Oh, my um, Lord. So if there is a God, mm. and you know I'm an atheist, so yeah. I don't believe there is a God, but yeah. if there is a God, he may have been trying to, or she, may have been trying to teach me a lesson. Uh -huh. Did you learn that us, lesson um, well? That all of us are subject to these things. These uncertainty but, principles. Huh? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The miracle here, as far as I'm concerned, is that we well, we've had another storm of that magnitude uh, a year ago, and now we are having yet another, and this is apparently the hurricane of the century, the, uh, the impossible storm, two storms colliding and producing an even bigger storm. And uh, despite that, you and I were supposed to do something tonight, but yeah. we were closed the subway system. We mm -hmm. were supposed to do a, a talk to producers of uh, public access cable. 
Yeah. And um, the mayor promoted the subway system, which is the one great thing you can always rely on. Very, very seldom does New York ever close its subway. They want to protect those cars against damage. Right. Among and they're telling so. us that we should stay indoors because if we go outdoors and something untoward happens to us, we put a stress on the first responders yes. and force them to go out in this gale to rescue us. Mm. And that is an unfair burden okay. on the public system. So I have stayed indoors much, I loathe it, <laughs> indoors. I mean, without a four-mile or a three-mile walk every day, I see you. I'm miserable. I think so, you're not the only one in that state of mind this evening. But there's also a factor, um, I'm sitting in, in my bedroom, which is where I produce Howard the Columbus, and uh -huh. my video, YouTube video series, which has had 45,000 hits for its least, least watched episode and 163,000 for its most watched episode. Uh -huh. A lot of stuff goes on in this bedroom. Yes. The windows are directly behind me. They're uh -huh. about five feet behind me. Mm -hmm. And beyond those fourth-story windows, there are trees. And the trees have been whipping around yeah. since 3 o'clock this afternoon. And it's been very obvious just from the noise level that these trees, which still have all of their leaves, they're not yet at the point where they're ready to drop their leaves. They're holding onto their leaves tenaciously. Well, those leaves, think of the aerodynamic properties of leaves. Leaves are all surface um, and very little internal substance. Surface is what interacts with the air. So the degree of friction, of interaction, of viscosity for the wind is tremendous. And as a consequence, we're in danger not just of losing leaves, we're in danger of losing limbs to trees. And when limbs start flying around, you do not want to be outdoors. In fact, even being indoors can be unsafe because if your glass, if your windows shatter, you're in serious trouble. You're totally at the mercy of the storm. So, yes, there's a little, what the French call a frisson, mm. of stress in my system, despite the fact that I usually love confronting death-defying situations and coming out alive. Get a poem out of it. Get a poem out of the greatest travail is the, one of the you know uh, hallmarks of a great poet, I think. Well, there's a, and there's a secret thrill uh -huh. um, to facing something that is deadly. Yes. Um, and to overcoming it. I mean, I've done this uh, once upon a time. I was uh, riding the rails um, back in the days when I was accidentally helping to start a, a new movement out in uh, California. Good this for you. In 1962, I was looking for the beatniks. The beatniks had disappeared. <laughs> I didn't know that. So I was hitchhiking and riding the rails up and down the coast looking for the long-lost beatniks, and people yeah. began to drop out of their jobs and follow me. Uh -huh. At one point, I took a, uh, a coal car from, um, uh, from California all the way to uh, Nevada. And um, I was standing, uh, a coal car is not a good place to be. I, if, if you ever decide to ride illegally on freight trains, uh -huh. strongly advise you to avoid coal cars. Okay, um, thank you for that uh, sound right. advice. Yeah. When you're sitting in a coal car, there are no shock absorbers. So when uh. the train gets up to about 65 miles an hour, you are bounced. <laughs> two and a half feet off the ground, then smash down on the metal again. Okay. So, and that happens to you over and over again. So I hope our listeners are all are listening very acutely. Right. Hot yeah. tips for people who want to ride the rails. Yeah. Um, so you have to stand. And that would not be a problem, except for the fact that there's coal dust in the coal car. I don't care how empty it is. And the wind whips the coal from the back of the car to the front, whips it up into the air, um, then whips it back at 65 miles an hour toward the back and does it all over again. It's a kind of convection current. Mm. Well, that means your face is being sandblasted by coal dust Good grief. hitting it at 65 miles an hour. Yeah. And the result is that after a very short amount of time, you are so black that it looks as if you've changed your racial profile. Um, and your eyes have become little slits with red bands across where the coal is hitting. It, it's a somewhat painful experience. But then there's the fact, and here's where we get to death to find. Uh. Then there's the fact that um, on the underside of the car, the, the entire floor of the car is made of six great big metal sheets. Mm. And those metal sheets are hinged so that when a coal car comes into a place where it's going to unload its coal... They can download it, Yes, exactly. You simply have to open the flaps and the coal goes downward into whatever is beneath the rails. Yeah. Well, that could be a problem. Uh, well, I, I had been riding probably for about four to five hours uh, and gone a good distance. We were already somewhere in Nevada.
Nevada. But I have this funny feeling that um, it might be a good idea to switch from the panel I was on, the metal panel I was standing on, uh-huh. over on the front left, uh-huh. to the metal panel on the front right. Uh-huh. So I did. I switched. I took my brief, my, my knapsack, and the two of us, the knapsack and me, both moved. Uh-huh. Ten minutes later, the flap I had been standing on for five hours, with a tremendous bang, flapped wide open. <laughs> And if I had been on that flap, uh-huh. you wouldn't be speaking to me today. Yeah, I would have indeed. Been in indeed. Another close call, huh? Yes, exactly. But yeah. these little confrontations with death can be absolutely exhilarating. However, uh-huh. I think that you, when you're sitting in the house like this and yeah. obeying orders and not going out and adventuring and yes. walking two miles through the park yeah. in the storm, that's when you feel the stress. <laughs> For out, when you're out there where you can confront the elements like King Lear howling into the mouth of the storm. Amen. Uh, yeah, then you feel in command. Yeah. So so that's a little essay on stress. And that's that. really good. You can pass that on to your other view or listeners later in that. Right. It's really good. Okay, well, that's, I think that's really well taken, and that's a good uh, practical lesson for the uh, followers of Woody Guthrie and company. Well, here's the other practical lesson. We are overcoming this storm. Thank humans you. Are, humans are doom riders. Um, humans are catastrophe tamers. Um, we've done this ever since we became human. And our job right now, I'm, right now in foreign policy, there's a new article or a new debate, really, mm-hmm. about the um, Club of Rome uh, book that came out a long time ago. Limits to Growth. It, I, it came out in the 1960s, would that 1970s. Be, would right, would that be it, Limits to Growth? The Limits to Growth. Uh-huh. And it told us that by the 1980s, we'd be so overcrowded that we'd be standing on each other's shoulders, uh-huh. we'd be running out of oxygen and food. Shades and, of Mr. Malthus. Right. And none of that, none of that came true. And uh-huh. here's why it didn't come true. Uh-huh. Humans have been the tamers of disaster ever since we became human. Because we became human, first of all, by becoming a migratory species. Baboons migrate over relatively short distances. Okay. They do migrate. Uh-huh. However, they've never migrated out of Africa, uh-huh. to the best of my knowledge. Possibly, mm-hmm. I believe there's been some boons, baboons in Saudi Arabia. That's as far north as they've gotten. Uh-huh. And these stay in place. Okay. Um, apes stay, mountain apes stay in place. Mm-hmm. Um, we humans, because we are migratory, are testers of new environments. Okay. And we came to be fully human in a time of disaster, catastrophe, of climate, uh, climate collapse, because we came of age in the Ice Ages. And we learned to live, um, in, in the anthropological term is paraglacially. That is, we came to learn, look, learn to live on the very edges of the glaciers. Glaciers that were grinding up mountains, uh, glaciers that were wiping out entire ecosystems. Mm-hmm. And yet we lived on their margins. And in the process of confronting them and overcoming them, we developed technologies that turned us from Homo erectus into Homo sapiens and Homo sapiens sapiens. Mm. So we've been doom riders and catastrophe tamers from the beginning. Well, when the when the um, uh, the ice sheets went away, when the ice age was over, um, there had been a territory uh, from about 11,000 BC until about 9,000 BC that that was green and lush. And for reasons that are not completely known, that territory eventually dried, parched, and became a desert. Mm-hmm. Um, it was called the Sahara. Yeah, there's and, massive. Well, there's so massive uh, group. There's massive surveys of uh, fossil water under the Sahara Desert. Right. From that and time, yeah. So, meantime, there was a territory to the east that was uninhabitable. It was uninhabitable because it was a long, skinny valley. The rains were nonstop. The floods were nonstop. The few humans who tried to live there all died a violent death, presumably at each other's hands. We know that from the remains left in graves. Uh-huh. Um, and and but but humans moved into that valley and were able to do so successfully because they tamed a catastrophe. There was a catastrophe that arrived predictably every single year: a massive flood. Uh-huh. So the people in this valley learned to live on hillocks. They uh-huh. learned to live on places protected from the flood, and they farmed the area that was flooded. They allowed the flood to, to deposit new soil, soil from a 4,000-mile-long river course right. um, on the land. Uh-huh. Then they waited until the floods went away. They didn't have to use plows. Why? Because the sun baked the mud, uh-huh. and in baking the mud, it created huge gaps. 
and all these people had to do was plant their seeds in the gaps. Uh -huh. Well, the land we're talking about is Egypt. The of river course. we're talking about is the Nile. Uh -huh. Egypt is a gift of what we pluck from catastrophe. So tonight, being on the telephone like this, yes. in the middle of a howling, whipping, punishing <laughs> storm, is yes. another demonstration of yeah. the fact that Club of Rome people were wrong because we humans overcome disasters by inventing new things. Yeah. And, and the, the Club of Rome did not take human inventiveness into account. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's and, and not only that, um, Howard, maybe you could speak to uh, how good humans actually um, are, uh, are goal-orientated. If, if once we have a goal, we really can achieve that, too. Right, exactly. We are goal-oriented. We, look, we were destination-oriented for a long time as, migra as migra migratory uh, beings. And um, you point to a destination, and we want to go toward it. Point it as a paradise. Yes, it will be a paradise. What is a paradise? A paradise is new territory that is rich in resources that we can invent a way to mine. And this search for new resources by migratory movement is not new to humans by any stretch of the imagination. I mean, you can think of migratory birds and migratory elk and all kinds of animals, including migratory crustaceans. Um, huh. uh, not crayfish. I'm trying to think of the name. Lobsters? Oh, spiny, uh, spiny lobsters. Yes. Very specific kind of lobsters. Not to mention clams. Well, clams don't my clams migrate no, they, in a whole different way. Okay. Um, what spiny lobsters do is get together in groups of roughly ten thousand and go on a long, long march. Uh -huh. And seasonally, they shift to a more favorable location. Now, clams have their own trick for migration. You can look at a clam and go, "My God, how the hell could a clam possibly go anywhere?" <laughs> uh, yeah. It's stuck in place. But the clam gives birth to these little things called villagers, and villagers look like human sperm. They have long, whip-like tails, and those tails are propellers. Huh. So the parents are built to sit in one place, but the children are built to travel, and they go out seeking their fortune, quite literally. That's they go really out seeking an environmental niche uh -huh. that they can mine using the strategies of clamdom. And bacteria do the same thing. Now, why bring up bacteria? Because bacteria were around 3.5 billion years ago, uh -huh. and they are our form of it. We are descended directly from them. Yes, we, we are. carry many, many genes whose details they worked out, they invented for us. And here's what bacteria do. And one kind of bacteria, uh, Crescentis, um, Crescentis bacteria um, have a stalk, and they root themselves to their food source. They root themselves with a glue so solid that modern material scientists have not been able to come anywhere near its strength, its bonding strength. Um, and they suck up all the food they can get. But like the clam, when they give birth to a second generation, the second generation no longer has a stalk. It has a tail. And again, that tail is a whip-like propulsive thing. Um, and again, like, like spiny lobsters, um, the Crescentus bacteria get together in groups of 10,000. They do not travel on their own. They travel in packs. And they go out exploring the wilderness. And they explore the wilderness to find a new food source, because eventually the food source their parents have depended on is going to dry up. And it's by going to another location. It's by exploring new locations. It's like the honeybees have certain people who go out and serve that kind of function. Is that yeah, not right? That's right, exactly. The searcher, the searcher bees. A few, 5%, five percent maybe. Yeah, they're five percent of a bee society, but in, in really good times they can go down to two percent. In really bad times they can go up to twenty percent of them. And we're dependent upon them tremendously. Yeah, we depend on all of these creatures that mm. go out seeking things. Mm. Uh, bacteria, you, you and I consist of roughly um, 550 trillion cells. Only 50 trillion of those cells cling to when me. The other five trillion, are 50 to 500 trillion, mm. are bacteria. And bacteria live in very organized colonies in which the individuals are constantly um, swapping messages, uh, constantly weighing things, constantly looking for new solutions um, to problems. So we are dependent on the bacteria. Those bacteria in our gut are the ones who digest a good part of our food. That's it's about, of our food that we can't digest. That's they, about 90, it's, I've read that it's about 90% of the 100 trillion cells in a, in a normal uh, homo sapien is in the gut in the form of bacteria. Right, and, and there are additional bacteria that make your armpits smelly. Uh -huh. God knows what function that serves. There are <laughs> bacteria that line.
line your trachea that, and, and that line your mouth and your nose. Yeah. Why? Because they are defenders. They are the garrison that protects you from incoming would-be invaders. So um, we are these mountains of synergies, to use the word that, that you like, Carol. I do like uh, it very much, yeah. Right. But we are mountains of exploration machinery. Uh -huh. Bacteria operate by exploring new territory. We operate by exploring new territory. And when we run out of new territories to explore, when we run out of goals, something weird happens to us. Back to goals for a second. The, the, the greatest, one of the greatest things that John F. Kennedy ever did for this nation was point us at the moon and give us a clear goal. And we achieved it, but we've had no clear goal since then. And Proverbs says that without a vision, a nation shall perish. Mm -hmm. And Proverbs is extremely right because there is a psychological and biological um, punishment to shutting down and ceasing to explore. Um, it's Absolutely. a state of mind. We go through two radically different polar opposite states of mind. One is when we have a whole bunch of new resources. Then we get all excited. Then we get exhilarated. Then we have visions like crazy. Then we explore all kinds of possibilities. Then we are exuberant as all hell. And we also have a tendency to reproduce quite a bit. Um, that's called the um, K phase in population biology. Its opposite is the R phase. And in the R phase, we run out of resources. We reach the carrying capacity of our environment. And we shut down. We shut down perceptually. We cease having grand visions of things. We no longer have exuberance. Instead, we have dour moping. Um, and we go into a perceptual mode of self-denial, of blaming ourselves for everything and telling ourselves we should cut down on everything. We Jeremiah. Well, Harold, uh, I mean, Howard, do you think that we really have a lot of goals yet to get to? I mean, scientists like Mishikaku, man one, man two, man three, I don't think that there is, uh, either through design or through the fear factor of economics, um, that, that we're, not, we're not being taught these things, and so therefore our goal setting has been shut down. Well, we have a problem. Uh, the... Eco, the eco subculture. Okay. Um, I first ran into it in the 1950s yeah. when um, someone came. I was a program director for my school. I, I programmed all of the school assemblies uh, at the age of 16. Ah. And um, one of the people that I booked came to tell us since roughly 1960 um, about whaling and showed us these horrible pictures of the things that are done to whales. Yeah. Um, and told us that within a few years the whales would all be gone. That was 1960. Well, at that point, people like that were very much on the fringes. And then there was a wildly successful promotional, 10 years of parallel promotional um, developments that helped push eco-thinking the, from the periphery to the very center of our society. And we needed that. I mean, Earth Day, for example. If you look at the history of how Earth Day was put together and the celebrities that were lined up behind it and the man who put it all together, it's amazing. It's who was that person? I have it linked to John McConnell. Among that's them. it. That's it. John, yeah, John McConnell's a wonderful gentleman. Yeah, well, he's quite an astonishing achiever. Yeah. And he put um, the eco uh, focus on the map, put it center stage. Yeah. Um, with Earth Day, the folks from Greenpeace, by taking a ship, that was um, 1970. Out to confront the uh, the the French uh -huh. when the French were about to explode a nuclear weapon, one of the greatest PR stunts of all time. Uh -huh. And by doing an effective job of PR, something of <coughs> difference in society, they brought eco uh, eco thinking from the fringes to the center. They brought a new vision um, to people again. They started getting giving people a way to to think again, uh, or a goal to achieve whatever the goal may be. The other thing that was interesting is they didn't accept money from the government, so they weren't binding to any one group but their vision. But remember, uh, they did accept the fact, that um, something that came from their efforts, that Richard Nixon, of all people, established the EPA. Uh -huh. Right, um, right. On their behalf. Yeah. So, so Another were, synergy. But here's the difficulty. <laughs> they, one of the things that they wanted to do, they recognized that raising a new generation um, steeped in your perceptual system is the best way to t take a perceptual system from the outer fringes to the center. And you saw when you, every school 
you walked past, you saw second grade and third grade um, artwork uh, on the windows. And that artwork was all eco-thinking. Mm -hmm. So they did manage to raise at least one generation in eco-thought. Now, here's the difficulty. If you go, go to my book, The God Problem, Endless <laughs> Cosmos Creates, mm -hmm. one of the principles that you'll see is opposites are joined to the hip. And opposites are actually usually in a dynamic and productive battle and balance with each other. Okay. Um, we had too much of eco-thinking. Another principle in, in my books is that any good thing in excess is a poison. We needed to be aware of limits. We needed to be aware of those systems that we were disturbing that we needed to restore. Um, we needed to know <laughs> oxygen comes from uh, the vigorous growth of plants, um, mm -hmm. for example. All these things were necessary, and we needed to be aware of the fact that in New York, when I first got to New York in 1964, I had a, a, a bunch of white pants and white shirts, and I rapidly learned in 1964 that you could not wear white pants and white shirts in New York City. Mm. Why? Because the um, so, coal dust mm -hmm. coming from Con Ed smokestacks um, was so ubiquitous mm. that anything mm. you wore that was white would be gray, mm. flecked with black <laughs> at the end of the day. Yeah. Well, it was the environmental movement that got that changed. It yeah. was the environmental movement that got rid of these uh, pollutants in the air, yeah. pollutants that can kill you. How do you, how do you cancel uh, Rachel Carlson's contribution to all well, that? Well, Rachel Carlson was the one who really got people excited Silent about spring, all of yeah. this. She was the great propagandist, if you want to put it that way. Right. Um, she was the one who gave emotional vigor um, to what the movement was trying to say. And so her contribution was huge. But the point is that we are now suffering an overdose of eco-thinking. Think and so? okay. eco-thinking is the thinking of the R strategy. It is the thinking of those who begin denying themselves everything. It is the thinking of a specific bio, biological mode, that mode that comes up when everybody is convinced that we've hit the carrying capacity of our environment. Sorry, we never hit the carrying capacity of our environment. We never do. We never lack, in, uh, we are not suffering from a lack of resources. We are suffering from a lack of imagination. Absolutely, absolutely. There is, there is no one to do what John Kennedy did and point us in the direction of a goal, taking advantage of the instincts that we inherit from our migratory for, forefathers and foremothers going all the way back to bacteria. We need a clear goal. Uh, you know, I'm, I, one of, the, well, Buzz Aldrin kidnapped me. Um, in roughly 2006 um, to start a group. The group is called the Space Development Steering Committee, and Edgar Mitchell, the sixth man on the moon, is also a tremendous, tremendous supporter. And uh -huh. the reason that I went along with Buzz, the reason I was so eager to put this group together, is because America suffers from a uh, vision deficit. Um, yes. We do not have that clear and simple vision of a new paradise, a paradise of our own making in a new location. And we need it badly, because that's what we need to get out of the bio phase of self-denial and back into the bio phase of exuberance, and it's the exuberant who explore new possibilities. It's the exuberant who invent new things. Necessity is not the mother of invention. Open frontiers are the mother of invention. Brand new frontiers people have never imagined before. And we have those frontiers in two areas. One is whatever comes after cyberspace, look at the vast real estate that's been open to us in cyberspace. Look at what it's done for our economy. Look what it's done to transform the very nature of what it means to be human. You and I right now are speaking courtesy of electrospace, mm -hmm. um, a space more primitive than cyberspace. Mm -hmm. um, in cyberspace, you can erect a website. It costs you nothing or almost nothing. And if you are good at promoting it and if you have something of value to offer, you offer a new treat to your fellow human beings. Mm -hmm. um, Twitter has done that. Tumblr has done that. Facebook has done that. Google has done that. Amazon has done that. This is all in space that didn't exist 20 years ago. Do you think, do you think Howard, that the limitations that we're, we're having is because corporations have taken over and created scarcity and not allowing us to achieve the potentiality of these systems? Like no, having, having worked, you know, I did... Uh, my field is mass behavior, from the mass behavior of quarks, elementary particles, to the mass behavior of human beings. And I've spoken, I, I told an international conference of quantum physicists in 2005 why everything they, in Moscow, why everything they know about quantum physics is wrong. 
and I have a direct <laughs> rocket scientist, and, and psychology and biology are also um, big territories for me. Uh -huh. But I did, I had to go in, I wanted to go into something that was seemingly impossible for me. I was a science nerd, I listened to, to Stravinsky, Bartok, Beethoven, and Rachmaninoff, and I ended up going into popular culture, which I knew nothing about. And in the course of going into popular culture, or culture, I worked in the corporate world for 20 years. And I can tell you from personal experience that there is no way that corporations want to produce um, scarcity. Um, and I'm going to qualify that in a minute by talking about Apple. Because there are specific uses for a perception of scarcity, but not real scarcity. Corporations want to churn out as much of the product that worked for them yesterday as they possibly can. Yeah. They have no vision of the product that you're going to need tomorrow. Um, and when they churn, when they have the capacity to churn out uh, millions and millions of units of whatever yesterday's good was, and you're sick of yesterday's good, you've had it with it already, they are in a state of corporate pain um, because their profit margins are slipping, because it's looking like they are irrelevant. The only people who want to create anything like scarcity are those who want to create a false perception of scarcity in order to sell more of their product. Well, some Apple, people some people define uh, science, and another sidebar question would be what you think of the educational system, but they define uh, the science or understand, they would want it to be a science of e economics as the allocation of scarce resources. To assume I, enough what? or uh, sufficiency is almost taboo in those circles. Well, you have to remember that, or they're modeling. Yeah. that economics doesn't work. Okay. The, the very premises of economics are so faulty that economic um, uh, mathematical systems, the mathematics on which economics is based, are always at fault. Fisher, the great economist of the 1920s, yeah. in 1928 said, we will never have a depression again, ever. Right on the eve of 1929. Yes, yeah, so then came 1929. <laughs> yeah. so Fisher, with all of his sophistication and all of his worldwide fame, was he on target? Absolutely not. But he was the leader of his time in that in those venues. Right, and yeah. meanwhile, um, uh, Queen Elizabeth apparently sent a note to her economic advisors after 2000 crashes of 2007 and 2008, saying, "Why don't didn't you guys predict this? I mean, you have computers, you have sophisticated math. Well, when you're premises are wrong, when your assumptions are right. wrong, when your axioms are wrong, everything you do is going to be wrong. Mm -hmm. And the dismal science is what uh, Thomas Carlyle yep. called eco economics. It's right. gone no further than in, in, I mean, it's gone a lot further. It's elaborated. It's made excuses for its existence. Mm -hmm. But in reality, it is incompetent. In reality, it cannot deal with what, um, oh God, what is his name again, called black swans. Oh, um, that's, uh, yeah, Talib. Yeah, um, Nicholas Nassim Talib. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, it, and unless you can deal with bad black swans, you're not doing economics. Well, those are synergies. What do you think of the educational, higher educational system in terms of its tendency to move very rapidly toward extreme specialization? Well, you and I both know that extreme specialization is a mistake for certain people. Mm -hmm. There are certain people who have omnivorous curiosity. It's also a bad thing for evolution. Yes, well, but you need both. You need yeah, both. You need I, th both. I think right. you need both, Howard. Yeah, but let him answer. Yeah. Yeah. But, but it, it's back to opposites are joined at the hip, Harold. You need the specialists who will dig deep, 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 deep into a tiny little corner. And that deep, deep, deep diving can be used like Surat's dots yeah. in the Impressionist painting or uh -huh. Pointless painting. Uh -huh. um, he's building a dot for you. Mm -hmm. Now, you and me, we just happen to be omnivorously curious people. Yeah. And because of that, we need to have science without boundaries. Well, we need to see the big picture. Well, yeah. there's room for us, and there are rooms for the dot makers. Is there but much room for us, or for real, honest to God, comprehensive systems thinking, or is that assumed to be master, uh, jack of all trades, master of none, and not give any credence in terms of uh, allocating tenure, peer review, and that kind of thing? Well, you know that the systems thinking group, uh, Peter Corning was president of of it for a while. He was a friend. Oh, uh, Bar Barabasi, are you still there? Yeah, we're here, yeah, okay, by all but means. We're, we're getting a little beeps. Mm. Um, but um, uh, there is a large group of system, the systems thinkers, and it was doing its best to insert system thinking into society, but I was always a little bit suspicious of it 
because rather than just taking opening systems and taking a look at them, it seemed to have a pre-digested um, pattern for, um, uh, for analyzing systems. Nonetheless, the fact is, it is very, there, there are very few courses that I know of in high school, college, um, or grammar school that are teaching the big picture. There is, um, yeah, the, uh, there should be a department at a university of everything. Yes, I agree with you. And, and you know that I, they don't I, exist. It, Those things do not exist. It's well, called in absurd. Two, in 2001, I wrote a manifesto for something called omnology. And Thank the, you. And the purpose of omnology, you know, the, you could easily say, but why did you bother to come up with omnology? E.O. Wilson already had consilience. Yes, that's right. Consilience is a word that indicates submission gestures. Um, it? it indicates bowing in front of other things. Um, um, uh, uh, omnology has an entirely different ring. Omnology is the aspiration to omniscience. Now, that may sound silly, the aspiration mm. to omniscience, but mm. if you don't shoot high, you don't get anywhere. Mm. And shooting at high, I mean, once upon a time, humans couldn't fly. 2,800 years ago, Daedalus was dreaming about it, the yeah. myth of Daedalus and Icarus, mm -hmm. uh, with the wax wings that yeah. melted when Icarus got too close to the sun, yeah. the dream of flying. Well, human beings stuck to that so diligently, generation after generation after generation, that by Leonardo's day, Leonardo was drawing all kinds of potential flying machines. He never flew them, he only drew them. And uh, in the 19th century, there were enthusiasts continuing in that tradition. Um, and guess what? Those enthusiasts, like Lilienthal, who did thousands of flights with gliders, gliders, those were brand new. Uh, Daedalus would have killed for a ride on a glider. So would Leonardo. Oh, yeah. Well, you're a albatross now, too. But Lilienthal kept track of every glide he made and paid attention to the camber of the wings and all kinds of arcane little details. Yeah. Well, he died in a final glider crash. Uh -huh. But guess what happened to his book, Two Bicycle Makers? in uh, Ohio, Dayton. bought his book and poured over every little detail and manufactured wings whose camber could be changed in flight and made not the first flying machine, there were already flying machines in Europe, but the flying machines in Europe could only go in a straight line. Uh -huh. How useful is a flying machine that has to be pointed in the right direction and then can't turn? Yeah. What the Wright brothers developed is a flying machine that could turn, that was steerable. And they couldn't have done that without Lilienthal, thousands of flights. They couldn't have done it without the 70 generations, or whatever it is, of mm -hmm. humans from Daedalus' day who had applied themselves to the silly and ridiculous dream. So it makes sense to dream high. It makes sense to dream of being omniscient. I mean, that's what you want. That's what I want. Absolutely. How about Star Trek and the ability that money is no longer an issue but our dreams and aspirations? Uh, and, and specifically the economic systems like binary, um, what is your thought on the economic systems and where we can go to free us from doing the mundane so we can think really large thoughts and, 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 and uh, be able to do those kind of stuff thinking? Well, that's a kind of multi-part question. It's yeah, and you've economic. written on that. You've written on that. Yeah. Right. As far as monetary things are concerned, I've spoken to a number of groups, especially Daniel Pinchbeck's group, that is very big on alternative economics. I'm a, uh, a senior consultant to a company called Cornerstone Global, and one of its founders, the person who brought me in, um, is dedicated has dedicated his entire life to alternative forms of money. But I don't believe that alternative forms of money are the answer. Um, first of all, the answer to how we can dedicate ourselves full-time to thinking uh, is coming out of uh, technology. Um, it's, it's coming out of the fact that you know, for my latest book, when I, when I research a book, I go absolutely berserk. <laughs> I will consult sometimes as many as uh, three sources in a minute. Uh -huh. which, uh, imagine that. that that's a hundred sources in an hour. Uh -huh. um, and, and sometimes I've consulted almost a thousand sources by the end of a single work day. Wow. Well, how in the world can I do that? Uh -huh. I can do that because of a laptop and because of Google Book Search. Uh -huh. um, I could not do it in a traditional library. In a traditional library, I'd be limited to 20 to 30 sources a day, which by now I would regard as ludicrous. The things that are freeing us up from, from manual labor, our old kinds of labor, are these machines, which are taking over more and more of the mundane roles we don't need humans in, and allowing more and more of us to at least be artists in our spare time. But there's a problem right there. Yeah. The 
problem being if if the mon if the people the machines are taken over nobody has a job then there has to be some way that the people can own the capital production or and if that if that's not viewed then 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 the collapse happens like we're seeing now so I, I don't know if you uh, were, uh, viewed uh, binary economics with Lewis Kelso. No, I haven't seen that. Okay, well that's something that you may want to uh, bite into. We'll we'll share later, but that has a great um, bridging point that I think is a missing link, if I can call it that, to allow uh, the movement of prosperity and abundance and allow everybody to to own that capital production. So in the future, binary with Lewis Kelso. Um, Norm Curlin with CESJ.org yeah, uh, is Ashford. a good Ashford um, and Mortimer Adler had signed on to the original book. Yeah, and it's a way of forming capital. So rather than having it concentrated in the past savings of the already wealthy, which has been the pattern, it uh, wants to form capital in a way where the ownership of capital, increasing capital instruments, increasingly responsible for production in a ratio with labor can be democratized to one and all as an instrument of uh, creating uh, effective demand so that people will have the ability to clear the market. And purchase. Right. Well, it sounds useful. I know Bernard Lachey. Do you know uh, who he is? No, I'm sorry, not. I, I looked up your book. You told me about Abundance. That's a new book. Right. Well, now that's uh, Peter, um, um, Peter Diamandis. Yeah, I know. Diamandis. Thank you for that lead, yeah. But I don't, I don't know the one you just mentioned. Um, Bernard Lachey is the man who designed the Euro. Uh -huh. and, and he is very, very big on uh, alternative currencies. And he, um, his analysis of alternative currencies is Jungian. He sees money as being a mother figure or something like that. Uh -huh. uh, it's not easy for me to follow. I, uh -huh. It's not the kind of thinking that I, I do very easily. Uh -huh. but, he, but there is a lot of talk about alternative monies, but I think, uh, okay. It's not so much alternative money, it's alternative systems to allow people to have money or own the capital production. And you don't even have to have money, but without having ownership of capital production, right? And so we can say, oh yeah, it can be overseas. It can be, you know, we don't have to have a job anymore. Then, then, then um, s the big projects can happen because if people don't have purchasing power, you know, then what good is it? I mean, it's like, you know. Y well, there's a, there are a couple of problems here. One is yes. Too much capital is being gathered in the hands of the super rich, mm -hmm. and contrary to the propaganda being put out about super rich, they only are job creators to the extent that they have the money that other people use to build businesses, mm. um, to build new businesses, and find ways to satisfy new human needs. It is extremely important in any system that you have um, entrepreneurs and visionaries. The great visionary of our time was Steve Jobs, and um, Steve Jobs, if you had tried to confine him in an environment where he answered to all of his employees and couldn't be his quirky, nasty, son-of-a-bitchy self, uh -huh. never have had the creative leaps right. um, that came from Apple. Um, meantime, there's a guy named um, Elon Musk in California. He has founded a company called SpaceX. All right, let me give you a little digression on space for a second. So space is, we have two great next frontiers. One is the next frontier, like the virtual world of, uh, that we get from the Internet, and the other is real world, and it's above our heads. Eight and a half minutes above our heads are, are resources that make all the resources of Earth look like a penny. Um, and they look like trillions by comparison, because we have asteroids, we have comets, we have moons, we have planets, and all of these things are waiting to be gardened. They are waiting to be greened. They are waiting to be cultivated by life. Um, right. And life is waiting to get there. I mean, how do we know that life is anxious to get to the stuff above our heads? Well, every cre just about every creature that we know that walks is oriented toward the sky. What? Oriented towards the sky? Yes. When two lizards or when two lobsters go up against each other to determine who's the boss, it's a height contest. They, they get up on their hind legs, and the one who gets the highest wins. Uh, by the way, height is a defiance of gravity. When, when you get up out of bed in the morning, when you're laying there on the mattress, you're obeying Mother Nature's laws. Mm -hmm. You're obeying the law of gravity. But the minute you put your feet on the floor and stand up, you are defying one of Mother Nature's most primary laws. Now, why in the world would Mother Nature build you to defy her laws? 
because Mother Nature is a self-reinvention machine. And she uses us and just about everything that's ever been in this universe to radically reinvent herself. So lobsters, lizards, they all go up against puppies. They all go up against each other with height contests. Now, once upon a time, about 120 million years ago, there was a pack of very loony dinosaurs. And I'm going to describe them in anthropomorphic. Hit pause. We're brown out right now. Where? Oh. Okay. Um, I don't know, pause. Just, just stop, mean? just stop. Okay, it's recording. Okay, we had uh, a little power surge and our telephones went off, so we're resuming the talk. Yeah, we got to, uh, it's all very interesting, it's all interrelated and so forth, and... Uh, so please continue, Harold. Well, the babies, okay, so babies, despite the fact that research says that they fixate primarily on human eyes, uh -huh. actually fixate, in my experience, fixate more on the skies. They fixate more on what's above their head. Uh, and there, there's a lesson in this. Um, by all, we are the only species on the face of the earth capable of carrying <coughs> ecosystems and nature beyond the <coughs> limits of the skies. Yeah. We're the only creatures on the face of the earth capable of transiting that eight and a half minutes to the realm of non-gravity, to the realm that we call space. Mm. Um, and nature wants to get there. I mean, the lesson of the dinosaurs is very clear. Rise as high as you can. The message of the baby's eyes is very clear. Rise as high as you can. The message of the lobsters, the lizards, and the puppies, all topping each other with who can get the highest, is rise as high as you can. And there's another little saying, um, and it's, and unfortunately I'm the one who came up with it, but still, um, so you might wonder about its validity, but nations <laughs> that look up go up, nations that look down go down. Yeah. Hang on. Civilizations, you still there? Yeah, yes, we're we are. here, we're here. Are you getting a okay. call or something? Yeah, civilizations that look up go up, and civilizations that look down go down. Yeah. Um, the, le the lesson of John F. Kennedy and his inspiring us what to um, new achievements was he pointed us at a specific destination. <laughs> he gave us a vision of a goal, and the goal was above our heads. And the task in front of us is to take life beyond this tiny little pebble. And if we don't see it, because we are in such a self-denying mode right now, mm -hmm. um, there are others who do. For example, the Chinese who put up the first units of their own <laughs> space station have talked about Chineseing the universe. Right. Um, Harold, we got a beeping sound. Did you call, dial a number or something? Um, uh, uh, my assistant might have tried to dial a number. Let me we run into the other room we, and see. Okay. Hey, okay. Whoever it is gave up. Okay. But okay. Yeah, well, that's... Point, that's but the point is, you're absolutely right about a goal. You're absolutely right about a destination. Um, when people dream of paradises in these new locations, they are correct, because we invent new ways to turn just about everything from trash into treasure and from uh, abomination or our emptiness into riches. Um, and that's our job, is to, have the, is to have the vision it takes to get there. To yeah, and, and then we, how, about, how about a system that allows people to have abundance as well? Uh, I think that's absolutely necessary. I think it had been happening until 1973. And in, uh, since 1973, frankly, the kind of abundance that we've achieved with personal computers, cell phones, entire new human capabilities, who, you know, total huge new ways of being human, has been astounding, astounding, absolutely astonishing. Yeah. The fact is that the, uh, an increasing share of um, what uh, of the economic pie has been going to the super rich. Um, still there? Yes. Yeah, we're here. We're here. We're okay. Here. We're just zooming in on the There comes that somebody's phone. My assistant phone. trying to make phone calls. Oh. But at any rate, yeah. um, so yes, there there is plenty to go around. Um, the capacities of, of those of us on Earth to churn out product is incredible. I mean, Americans are still, despite all of the competition from the Chinese the most productive, apparently, that we might be second to the Germans, but we are among the most productive people on the planet. We are far more efficient per individual worker than the Chinese are. That's all really, 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 really very interesting. All kinds of things could come up to it. I really thank you. It's been very enlightening. I look forward very much, but we're coming to the end of this, uh, this, this sojourn with you now, because we're coming to the end of the hour. And uh, would you, Stephen, put up the book, would you? Uh, so I want to thank you very much, okay? You've raised a million questions, and I want to uh, get a pitch in for the fact 
that next week, the 5th of November, you are going to be here at our place on 36th Street in person, and we're going to be uh, continuing this, and we're going to be having you here, and people are invited to be aware of that and to consider coming here to, inter uh, to have exchange with you as you uh, talk in your so eloquent kind of way, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of people interested in that. And also, we've got now up on the screen a picture of your book, The, the God Problem, How uh, a Godless U a Cosmos uh, Creates, a really interesting read that contains a lot of, as you can see, the, uh, the erudite uh, scholarship of you. And I thank you, Howard, very much for coming uh, here and putting up with this uh, brief uh, connection to our people out on the ACAP, uh, you know, network, and look forward to having you here in person a week from tonight. Well, it's been a lot of fun, and I thank you tremendously, Harold. It's my great good pleasure. So, uh, endless questions, and I look forward to continuing this, not only after next week, but uh, let's uh, continue this right into the future, this challenging future that we're all trying to deal with in new and creative ways. And we thank you very much for all your scholarship and work. Okay, have a good night, and see you next week. I look forward to it very much. We can touch base in the, during the week, but I look forward to that very much. And once again, Howard, Howard Bloom, a major intellectual on the world scale, and we thank you very much for all your work and for participating here. Okay? Got it. Got it. Until next week, brother. <laughs>